Hey guys, no, 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 Alex. Hi Alex. Max. Hi Max. Hi Flav. In order to study architecture, after you leave Macert, you apply to the School of Architecture here in Cork. And we're here at the moment in Cork School of Architecture. Um, it's a four year course, degree course, to get your degree. And then students typically take a year out and get work experience. And from there, then they come back and do their masters. And then they finish their studies. And then they go to get their practical experience. In terms of uh, why one would need an architect. They can sort of, I suppose, transfer someone's ideas into a built reality. They will work with you, the client, and they will also mediate between the, the building contractors so they, to, in order to, for a building to grow and, and become and to be built. And the typical process in terms of a project is you have a design stage, and design is organised through a series of sketches and sometimes models like we have here. And these models can be very helpful to um, non-architects because they can, they're, they're 3D, a physical element in which people can understand the space and so forth because plans sometimes can be a bit um, difficult to read for, for non-technical people and what you generally need is to get is permission from a council for your building and then you do a series of technical drawings which you give to a builder and they from there then they will work with that and then on site you will work with the builder in order to get the building built. Typically a project can take up to about four years from the initial time that you meet a client to actually the, moving into a building. To be honest, I love the diversity of what it is to be working in architecture because you're working on you can work on a variety of different design projects. And there's something very enjoyable um, in terms of when you design something that you can go from sketch to actually a built reality. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always have to be building, sometimes it can be a very small thing like designing a door or a door handle or a bench or, or you know very simple things but there's always that enjoyment and, and, and also the enjoyment and the energy that comes from working with the different craftspeople whether it be a joiner, a mason, a steel fabricator because you have to kind of collaborate in order to get things made you have to collaborate and that's a process too and you're always learning because every material is its different qualities and you need to learn from that as well. Would there be a lot of time put into designing the things? I think definitely there's an awful lot of I suppose on, for, on, on scene hours that go into the project because the thing about designing there's no fixed point. Like, how do you know when your design is finished? It's always trying to get to that point where you resolve it and you're happy with it. You generally come up with a concept, and when you have your main idea resolved and the clients are happy with it and so forth, then it's about refining it. And then there's an awful lot of work goes into kind of like almost different versions and iterations of it. When designing a brand new project, would you be limited to choosing brand new materials and building the entire project? From, from scratch, or would you be able to use some older materials, for example, sandstone that can be found, or um, would you be able to use an old building or something to build away from that? Yes, we can. You can use materials from the area. So in Cork, you think about Cork white limestone or Cork red sandstone, or even historically in Cork, there used to be seven brick factories. So brick would be another building or material that would have been used. So yes, it is possible, but the challenge is sometimes is that these materials tend to be more expensive because of the, the labour that goes into making them or extracting them, or sometimes even in terms of the stone, the quarries are no longer in use. It's part of all architects' work really is to kind of um, the opportunity when you get to restore historic buildings and, and maintain the life that that building has, whether it's in its cultural significance or if it's just in terms of maintaining the building for a different use. Uh, when did you pick architecture as your course? When I was a child I loved designing stuff and just drawing in general and my favourite subjects in school were DCG, construction and art so you know, I thought it was kind of the obvious choice. Does it take a lot of hard work like um, design and or like learning and all that? It's a lot of work, it's a lot of constant work, you know it's, it's not like you just um, Say, you know, you study at the end of a semester for your exam, it's like a constant workload and you're constantly learning. It's a lot of hands on kind of practical work. When designing a new project, what is your thought process while making it? Would you enjoy it? Where would you find the motivation for it? We look at a lot of precedents, which would be kind of buildings that already exist, and uh, we kind of study them. And also, you know, so we don't start off a brief, we don't get given a brief straight away. We kind of like say we say we're doing a performance building at the minute so we learn about performance and we kind of explore performance and then we kind of work from that we kind of get inspired from that and see how the performance then inspires a building that we make. There's a 
variety of what they can do. And I suppose that's the thing about ideas, like the things you bring all these ideas and then you have to kind of see if you can build them afterwards and understand them technically. And so it is enjoyable in that regard. Hi Jim. Uh, Christian, uh, this is Philip, Max and Alex uh, from the Upper Park School. Nice to meet you. Yeah. We have a few guys working for us, it's six in total, and one of them is Daniel and he will show you a little bit how we work stone um, today and how it's done for the past few thousand years as well. When we, when we start cutting a stone, we have to select the right stone and the right size and we usually do that in the quarry. Everything that we do is um, geometric and can be measured and it usually starts with a square block. We mark our first square face and you can see the lines here and what we do then, we use uh, start a very rough chisel which would be the first one in the process. This chisel here for example is called a pitcher and um, the job of a pitcher is basically just to remove the rough material. What Daniel does here now is, is the first step in the process. We, we select it, we turn um, the face that we want to work first. It, that is usually the straightest face on, um, on a stone. I can hear the sound. It, it sounds hollow already. So what he does there actually with that chisel he creates a crack in the stone, but a controlled crack. You can see it's, it's done roughly in the first round, and then he's going back, trying to um, get as much off as he can. Because the trick with stone cutting is to push each chisel as far as you can to make your life easier and to speed up the process. So what he does now, he's, he's checking if there's any more he can remove with the picture before we move on to the next tool. So the next step now would be to, to get a straight, smooth edge in here and just to rem remove roughly any, any excess waste. He's going to use a claw chisel. This now <coughs> is, um, is also a hand tool, but it has a, a different head on top of the chisel. And there we, we switch from the club hammer to a mallet. So, what you want to be careful is the corner because they tend to, to blow and break off. We, when we carve, we, um, we hit the chisel and we rip out the material because the, the reason for that is if we just go in like, like this, the blow will create a micro crack going down into the depth. But all we want to do is remove the surface. First of all, it's more efficient and it's a lot gentler to, to the mass of the stone underneath the surface. If you work with the rhythm, um, you see it's a lot more regular. And this is straight enough, it's actually not. We would push it further. Then you, um, and that's done all the way around. Then we can move on to the next tool. The tracer also has the mallet head and um, is used with, with the mallet then again. So, and basically you repeat what you did with the claw chisel, but it's a bit finer. You can see here, Daniel doesn't try to get it right now straight away. He's just getting it a bit more smoother, a bit closer to the line to get it even. So we check that with a straight edge and it's pretty decent for a first run without checking. So, and now we start marking and checking so that we get a really perfect straight line. You feel that? The whole point of, of getting the drafted margin ready is, imagine how that's all the way around is that we can then move on to 
the next step, which would be the pointed chisel. And I find that's one of the most important tools that we're actually using. And you can see he works with the system on there, so he is actually digging trenches in here to um, and working his way down. It's always from the highest spot down. You wouldn't get a corner completely ready now. He's digging into the stone now because it's it's very rough and the stone does allow us to do that, um, which which makes that chisel work like a wedge, and he's wedging off the pieces. Once he removed. The, the rough waste and he's down to this, you know, he will actually change that and he's ripping out the bits. Yeah. You can see he's always working from the edge in to protect the corner or the, the edges. Sometimes we use more modern tools instead of Cutting all that with the chisel, or we, we use grinders to speed up the process. But um, all the finishes that we do, in the most cases anyway, um, are still the traditional finishes that you see on, on buildings around the city or on Patrick's Bridge. We're working on Patrick's Bridge at the moment and carry out stone repairs. So that means we have to match what is there, and you can only do that if you, if you know about the old techniques. So Victor did also this stone here, and um, that's a replacement stone for, um, for the old arch. This piece here looked exactly the way this looks today when it was, was still new. The, the rough stone underneath, that's what we would have started with 60 years ago. Today we start with a saw and block, and then the next step would have, would have been all that work that Daniel showed you on the other stone. So that's the first thing we have to do, and from there then, we can use a template and draw or, or draw on our shape and work our way down. That's our own logo now, um, but it's called um, a quadrofoil. And that, that, that's something you find on old churches and old buildings. And Victor actually carved that now in, uh, into the stone. So let's thank so many for coming uh, along today. I hope um, you got a bit of an insight in, in what we do and, and how we work. And um, maybe you even consider an apprenticeship down the line because it's, it's certainly a passion. And um, with great opportunities, you can go into conservation work, you can go into the monumental mason, you can go into the stone masonry from here as well, building walls, dry stone walls, there's so much possible with stone and um, it's, there's just not enough stone cutters out there anyway, so but maybe keep it in the back of your head and uh, if you ever do want to carve some sort of stone, give me a shout. Welcome, welcome, boy. Welcome, welcome. This is uh, Max. Max, Alex. oh yeah, pleased to meet and you. Philip from oh yeah, we supply stone from all over Ireland. It's really um, building stone and paving stone, and we do a lot of stone cu cutting as well for architectural work, window sills, mostly using Kilkenny limestone, which would be a, a fairly local stone here. Cork, for instance, is um, mostly built with limestone so it's the most necessary product to be used here for, for window sills and wall cappings, chimney caps.
This stone here is a, it's a local stone from Tipperary up the road. Um, it's literally dug over the ground with an excavator, uh, put into the truck, brought down here and tipped out. So it's relatively easy to extract. This is used as a building stone only for walling. You can take it from here then into the shed over here, put into a stone splitter, which I'll show you in a minute, put into bags and deliver to site then so it's quite easy to work on the site. There's no waste and it's a kind of a brick farm that a stone mason can work quite easily. That's the stone there. So you're literally getting a big block, put it up here and it's split in the stone splitter and you're getting a nice brick it's almost like a concrete block, you know what I mean? So it's easy to build with. You can't build with that on site. You can build with that. Stand back a bit. Stand back a bit. Yeah. Blocks are dug out of a quarry up by Mallow. Uh, this would be more of a local stone as well, a hardest stone. Uh, which is literally dug out of the ground again. There's a lot of buildings in Cork that have to be repaired and whatever, uh, private buildings, castles as well. And uh, they're looking for local stone. It's done just for restoration work, not for new builds, because uh, it's, there's just, it's rare and it's, it's hard enough to get good quantities of it. This is a red uh, marble, it's a rare stone. It's actually a limestone, but it's referred to as a marble. Uh, because of its, its colours. It's used for old vanity units long ago. Washstands, Cove Cathedral, all these beautiful uh, cathedral buildings would use their columns for holding up the building with, with it. But they were cut out of blocks like these, which were just literally dug out of the ground. Now you'd always see seashells and coral in stone, but it's very rare to find something like this, which is uh, which kind of gives a fellow an understanding about where the stone comes from. This lobster would have landed on the seabed, and sediment would have came, landed in on top of him, and over millions of years, that would have compressed into stone. This sheet would have been part of a much bigger block, which might have been a 20 or 30 ton block. Uh, and, and, and literally drilled down in a straight line along the ground like this. And they could use the plugs and feathers as well. The block is separated from the cliff face then. Once you can do that, you can bring it from there, big machines and brought up and put onto the saws and sawn down then to various size, various thicknesses. This is the wire saw that I was explaining to you about, where we take our raw block and bring it up here and it's cut with this stainless steel wire with diamonds, they're called pearls, attached to it which do all the cutting and using water you can cut into the sheet form. Now these blocks are gone as far as we can go with them with the wire saw but we're still not finished, they still have to be cut. This rough edge has to be cut off with a circular saw. Yeah this is the circular saw, we're uh, cutting a block here for uh, another job. I don't know what it's for. The blade, as you can see, will only cut so deep. It will cut uh, about 250 millimeter depth, which won't cut a big block for you. But once you've cut into your sheets, you can finish cutting it with this, which is a much faster way of cutting.